all of the hydrogenation reactions we've seen so far have involved H2 as the hydrogenation reagent and some kind of metal catalyst that enables the syn addition of the two hydrogens. In a case when we need anti-addition, as for example when we want to synthesize a trans alkene from an alkyne, we need to think in a very different way about how to accomplish hydrogenation. To make this happen, we make use of reaction conditions involving metallic sodium, that is sodium in the zero oxidation state, sodium metal, and liquid ammonia. And because we're talking liquid ammonia here, pure liquid ammonia, not a solution, this needs to take place at low temperatures, usually something like minus 78 degrees Celsius, anywhere below the minus 33 boiling point of NH3. When we mix solid sodium with liquid ammonia, the metal actually dissolves into the liquid ammonia. And so this is called dissolving metal reduction. And this creates a remarkable species containing a single electron solvated by ammonia molecules. This is analogous, in a sense, to the aqueous proton or hydronium ion. It's sort of the negative analog of H+. H+, can be used as an oxidizing agent. This is a species that wants to accept electrons to a large degree. Analogously, the solvated electron can be used as a reducing agent. This is something that very, very strongly wants to be donated itself to any and all takers. Anything that wants to be reduced will accept this solvated electron, and that includes alkynes. And so in this dissolving metal reduction, the key step really is the addition of this electron. It's like a single electron, right? It's like a radical dot here to the alkyne. We'll see how this works and why this leads to transalkynes in the remainder of this video. Before getting into the organic chemistry of this, let's just talk about what happens when we mix solid sodium and liquid ammonia. This image shows a colorless sample of liquid ammonia at negative 78 degrees Celsius. And that's all that's there, liquid ammonia, NH3. This is not a solution of NH3 in water, it's pure liquid ammonia. When we take a hunk of sodium metal and add it into this solution, something interesting happens. The sodium metal starts to disappear and the resulting solution turns blue. What's happening here on the submicroscopic level is the oxidation of the sodium metal to sodium plus and the solvation of the resulting electron by ammonia molecules. Another way to draw this, focusing on a single sodium atom, is that that sodium atom is converted to Na plus and an electron, and this occurs because sodium metal is a strong reducing agent in and of itself. It wants to get rid of its electron, in a sense. Liquid ammonia promotes this process by solvating the sodium ion and the electron. And when we say solvating, we just mean that the NH3 molecules are engaging in ion-dipole interactions, for example, with the sodium cation. If we think of the generated electron loosely as an ion in its own right, we can imagine similar types of intermolecular forces occurring on the electron side, with now the positive, the partially positive hydrogen oriented toward the electron. The species on the right is what we call a solvated electron, and it's represented schematically here by this second product. The solvated electron is what gives rise to the blue color of this solution and it's an extremely strong reducing agent. What we've essentially done here is generated a bare electron, a single dot in a Lewis structure diagram without any accompanying atom. This guy is angry as a reducing agent and wants to be donated to whatever it can get its hands on. Let's just represent the reduced species generically as R. This amounts to a reduction since we are giving electrons, literally giving a electron to R. If R starts out neutral, then the resulting product contains both a radical and a negative charge. It's what we call a radical anion. A second transfer of a solvated electron would give rise to a simple anion. Protonation of this anion, of course, not with H+, which could not possibly exist under these strongly reducing conditions, but something that can supply an acidic proton, then gives rise to a product in which a new bond to hydrogen has formed. This is the essence of the strategy behind dissolving metal reductions of alkynes. New bonds to hydrogens in the product are established through the introduction of acidic protons coming from ammonia, in fact. These protons become acidic under these strongly basic conditions. And electrons coming from the solvated electron species. This reaction is trans-selective for reasons that we'll see shortly, and so it provides a great synthetic entry into transalkenes. Let's look at the mechanism in detail now. 
To represent the solvated electron, I'm simply going to use a dot, as this is essentially what it is, right? It's surrounded by ammonia molecules, but the active part of that species is the electron itself. Radical addition of the electron itself to the alkyne gives rise to a radical anion intermediate, and I'm doing something a little funky here where I'm combining one electron and two electron arrows. The intermediate that results contains an anionic carbon, one of the carbons of the original alkyne is anionic, and a radical carbon at the location where the electron was donated. Here's our key radical anion intermediate. We don't need to worry just yet about stereochemistry, as we haven't formed bonds to hydrogen yet. The next step is actually a very familiar two-electron event, proton transfer. This anion is extremely basic and can grab a proton from NH3 to form a neutral alkenal radical. In fact, even at this point, we don't yet have a stereochemical issue as the alkenal radical is linear. This species can undergo a second reduction by the solvated electron. And to show this, I'm just going to use a single arrow to the carbon that accepts the radical electron, like so. The product now is not a radical anion, but simply an alkenal anion. And now we do have to worry about stereochemistry, since this alkenal anion can have two different geometries one in which the lone pair is, say, cis to this R group, and one in which the lone pair is trans to this R group. This intermediate on the left is going to lead to the trans product, since the R groups themselves are oriented trans in this intermediate, whereas the structure on the right is going to lead to a cis product, since the R groups themselves are cis in this structure. Perhaps unsurprisingly, due to the size of the R groups and steric interactions in this intermediate, the alkenal anion isomer leading to the trans product is heavily favored over the cis isomer. And so this anion leading to the trans product is the preferred intermediate, and the trans alkene product forms selectively after a second proton transfer event. To help appreciate this mechanism, I think it helps also to draw the byproducts of the reaction. Notice that in these two proton transfers, we've generated two NH2 minus anions. To create the solvated electron intermediates that participate in these addition steps, we also needed to create two Na plus cations as well, in fact, before the alkyne was ever introduced. And so in addition to the trans alkene, two NH2 minus and two Na plus are generated in the course of this reaction. 